everyday injustice. Too many wrong for convictions, corruption has infected the criminal justice system. Leaving too many people helpless, fighting for their lives instead of receiving justice, people suffer. Is that why they say justice is blind? Hello and welcome to the Everyday Injustice Podcast. I'm your host, David Greenwald. For the past 10 years, we have operated Vanguard Court Watches in California, including San Francisco, Sacramento, and Yolo counties. Our goal? Expose everyday court injustices, and now, more broadly, shine a spotlight on injustices in the entire criminal justice system in the form of wrongful convictions, police and prosecutorial misconduct, and mass incarceration. This podcast hopes to take it a step further and highlight criminal justice reform on a national level. Everyday injustice. Today on Everyday Injustice, we're going to be talking about the book, The Fear of Too Much Justice. It just came out this week. And we have on here Stephen Bright and James Kwok. Welcome to our show. Thank you for having us. Thanks. So it's a pleasure. I think it'd be great maybe um, just if both of you could give uh, a little bit of background on yourselves. Um, you know, I have to go into a, a tremendous amount of detail, but just so that people kind of understand. Sure, I'll go first. I'm Steve Bright, and I uh, teach at the law schools at Yale and Georgetown Universities. Uh, but for about 40 years, I was involved in litigation of death penalty cases, uh, mostly in the South, and much of that time at the Southern Center for Human Rights in Atlanta, about 35 years there. Uh, and so what we've tried to pull together here is a lot of what uh, we saw, uh, have seen uh, in the cases, uh, as we've uh, tried to deal with the issues that are that are in the book. Thanks. So I'm James Kwok. I, uh, I've done a bunch of things. I went to law school um, when I was 39, and I took Steve's class on capital punishment. I also worked in the capital punishment clinic at Yale that Steve uh, oversaw where we worked on death penalty cases. And after law school, I decided to become a, a law professor. I was a professor at the University of Connecticut for 10 years. But I stayed in touch with Steve and with the Southern Center. I've been a board member of the Southern Center for Human Rights since 2013. I was the chair for a few years. And, uh, you know, it's just been a, it's been an honor to be able to work with Steve on this book and to help get these very important ideas that Steve and the Southern Center have been working on for so many decades to get those ideas out into the world. So I'm, I'm curious where the title of the book, The Fear of Too Much Justice, comes from. Well, in the case involving racial discrimination in the death penalty in Georgia that made its way to the Supreme Court in 1987, the court was presented with uh, evidence that the uh, Warren McCluskey in that case, a black man charged with a crime against or convicted of a crime against a white uh, man was 4.3 times more likely to get the death penalty because of his race and the race of the victim in that case, that racial combination. And the case was a 5-4, very close case. Uh, and Justice Powell, in his decision for the majority, said, well, we really can't deal with racial disparities. He acknowledged that there were disparities. In fact, he said disparities are inevitable uh, in the criminal system. And he said, if we deal with race discrimination in death penalty cases, then we'll have to deal with them with regard to all other kind of sentencing, so robberies and burglaries and whatever it may be. Uh, and Justice Brennan, in his dissent, uh, said that was the fear of too much justice. Uh, and so that's been sort of in my head since 1987. And I think it explains just about everything we talk about in the book, uh, why we don't provide poor people accused of crimes with uh, better lawyers, why we don't uh, better resource public defenders, uh, why prosecutors aren't required to disclose information of prosecution files and the police files. Uh, why we don't do better in dealing with people that have mental illnesses who come in that are just dumped into the criminal courts. Uh, and so we sort of look at what's going on. We look at what ought to be going on. We look at what some jurisdictions are doing. Uh, and 
uh, we conclude that the fear of too much justice is really what's keeping us from uh, having a much higher level of justice in our courts. Um, and, and maybe, you know, kind of break down some of the focuses of injustice in the book um, that you highlight. Yeah, so I think that, you know, the, the after the introduction, the first chapter is about the overwhelming power of the prosecutors. And then the second, the chapter after that is about the the failure of the courts and governments to enforce the right to counsel, right? So in in Gideon, what are we now? 60 years ago, the Supreme Court said that everyone accused, at that point, everyone threatened with uh, losing their liberty for one year or more was entitled to a lawyer. Later, that was extended to anyone facing any loss of liberty had the right to a lawyer. But since then, we've seen that you know, state and local governments have failed, and for the most part, have failed to adequately set up systems and adequately fund those systems to provide lawyers to poor people. And we've also seen that the Supreme Court has basically allowed this to happen. The Supreme Court has, has set extremely low standards for what it means to have uh, an, an effective attorney. And I, I focus on these two chapters because, you know, perhaps one of the most fundamental issues with the criminal courts is this disparity of power between the prosecution, which can rely on law enforcement to do their investigation, and then with defense counsel, who even, I mean, sometimes are not well-meaning at all, but even when they are well-meaning, often don't have the resources that they need to do their jobs. And, you know, we talk about the adversary justice system as, you know, the pride, you know, the pride of the Anglo-American legal system. And I think everyone would agree that for such a system to actually work, you have to be able to um, supply the defendant with a zealous, uh, able lawyer with the time and resources they need to get their job done. And, and that is just, in most cases, that's just patently not the case. And in some sense, I think that's the most fundamental problem with the criminal courts. And going back to the fear of too much justice, I think many people are aware of this problem. So why don't we do something about it? Why doesn't the Supreme Court do something about it? Well, you know, if every defense lawyer had a, sorry, if every defendant had a lawyer as good as Steve Bright, the, the system, as we know, would completely break down. You know, the system is predicated on the idea that more than 90% of people will plead guilty pretty quickly. And if that didn't happen, no one no one knows what would happen. And, and the uh, that's that's the fear of too much justice, I think. Yeah, and and the converse now is that, you know, not only are a tremendous amount of people pleading out, they're pleading out kind of under threat of tremendous sentences through the trial penalty. Um, and, and so we have people that are basically not exercising their Sixth Amendment right to a trial. Yeah, that's right. And we talk about that. And we talk about the incredible power uh, that prosecutors have in that regard. We talk about two women in Georgia, uh, both of whom were given an offer to plead guilty uh, if they would just simply uh, admit uh, their guilt, which really was not contested in either one of the cases, uh, testify if there was anyone to testify against. Uh, in both cases, the other participant in the crime took the deal and testified. Uh, and tragically, in both of those cases, the uh, Kelly Gisson Danner and one, Timothy Moss and the other, uh, rejected the plea uh, and were sentenced to death. And Kelly Gisson Danner was executed. Uh, and it was only a dispute over how much time before she would be eligible for parole. That was the only difference between what the prosecution was offering and what she and her lawyers were offering. So, and of course, even if she were eligible for parole, she might never get it. Uh, so based on this minute uh, difference between the two sides, uh, the prosecution exacts the trial penalty, which in this case was life itself uh, in, in her case. And uh, we see that, of course, in, in less draconian ways in a lot of other cases where a person can get five years if they plead guilty or 20 years if they go to trial. Uh, we see so many people in the, the great bulk of the cases, of course, are misdemeanor cases, minor cases where people are arrested, usually can't get out of jail. And uh, after they've been in for a while, they're told, well, if you plead guilty, we'll give you time to serve. You can get out today. Uh, if you want to go to trial, you'll have to stay in jail for another several months, uh, and uh, it may even be delayed then. So we have a lot of people who plead guilty just to get out of jail, 
Uh, but once they pled guilty, of course, that's a guilty plea on their record, uh, and that will come back to haunt them probably in the future. So do you, do you offer any, you know, remedies for this? Well, I think, I mean, this is one of the, the fundamental problems. And one, in some ways, it's a very difficult problem to solve. Because when the Supreme Court said that everyone had a right to a lawyer, they didn't provide any way to pay for this, right? So, so ever since, uh, most states and counties and local governments have been trying to uh, you know, get away with spending as little as, as, as they can on indigent defense. And the courts have been allowing this to continue. So I think, you know, I, I have two answers. I mean, one answer is that at the fundamental level, we need to be willing to spend more money on, on indigent defense um, if we're going to continue to pretend that we have the right to counsel in this country. Now, that, that um, may be difficult. Um, another, I think another thing that, that we talk about in the book is what North Carolina has done. So North Carolina has said that prosecutors have to disclose their entire files to defense attorneys. So they can't conduct a trial by ambush. And most importantly, so the defense attorneys know what the strength of the prosecution's case is, which gives them a much better, uh, much more leverage when it comes to plea bargains. Makes it much harder for the prosecution to, to pressure people into pleading guilty. And that is, that's a, in a sense, that's what you might call a procedural process change, a procedural change that doesn't really cost anybody money. And it was motivated by, by, um, by wrongful convictions, right? So in the past 25 years, we've come to realize that thousands and thousands of people have been convicted who are completely factually innocent, not just legally innocent. And this is one of the methods that can be used to address uh, that kind of problem. So that's, a, I think that's a promising um, development that other jurisdictions could take up. And the one other thing I would just say with regard to that uh, is that this trial penalty uh, it just can't be that severe. The courts have to recognize that uh, the right to trial is a fundamental right that people have it. It may be the other side of that coin, of course, is that if somebody takes responsibility, admits their uh, participation in a, in a crime, uh, expresses remorse, maybe in some way uh, we recognize that and, and, and reward that to some extent. But the idea that the, the, the life or death depends upon taking the plea or 15 years depends upon taking the plea. Uh, it's so excessive. Of course, our whole problem with sentencing generally is that it's excessive. Uh, but when you can put that kind of pressure on people to say, if you don't take this deal, you're gonna get 20 years or you're gonna get the death penalty. Uh, it really, there's really no bargaining there. You're really just coercing people uh, into pleading and you get a lot of innocent people pleading guilty because they're scared to death of, of what they're gonna get if they don't. So tell us a little bit about the Glenn Ford case. Sure. So, so Glenn Ford, we, we start off the book with Glenn Ford uh, because in some ways it's a almost a, un, sadly, it's almost a one of the mill case, right? So it's a black man accused of murder in the deep South. Uh, his attorneys, I, I um, basically have no, no, uh, he has gets appointed attorneys, um, this is a place, this is the 1980s when, when many, many states had appointed attorney systems, some, many still do, um, which means essentially you're getting somebody who is not, uh, who is taking the case because they're going to be paid a small and usually limited amount of money to take the case. So his attorneys had no, no experience in, in uh, criminal defense. He was tried before an all white jury because the prosecution struck all the black members of the jury pool and he was sentenced to death. And um, ultimately, he was exonerated 30 years later. And the one thing that's remarkable about this case is that the prosecutor apologized, um, which almost never happens. And he said, you know, I was young. I was, I don't know if he said naive, I was, but he said I was only bent on winning. And I didn't see the injustice of the fact that this man was not properly represented. I didn't see the injustice of trying him before an all-white jury. Uh, he didn't mention this, but also in a courthouse that had a monument to the Confederacy outside it. Um, and so it's a, it's a, we thought it was a, a, a fitting introduction to the kinds of problems that really pervade the criminal courts. So we, you know, we talk, there are a lot of death penalty cases in the book, but there are a lot of non-death cases as well, because the death penalty cases in many ways are the, 
the most striking example of these injustices, but they, but they really pervade the whole system. Um, yeah, I remember that case when he got released and it was really extraordinary to um, how heartfelt, uh, you almost felt sorry for the prosecutor, um, you know, even though, you know, obviously uh, Ford himself spent 30 years in, in prison. Um, the thing that strikes me, of course, is, you know, he's given $20. Um, and, you know, one of the one of the jokes is, uh, you know, if you're released on uh, parole, you get your $200 gate money. I don't know if it's still $200, but it was a few years ago. And, and you can at least take the bus out of there. If you get released uh, as an exoneree, you don't get anything. Um, and, and then you also don't get access to uh, post-conviction services. So, you know, you know, you can't go to the job training and you can't do all these other things because, oh, sorry, um, you actually don't qualify for that because you were innocent. Yeah, Ford also had stage four cancer when he left prison and he died a fairly short time after he was released. Uh, so it's a very tragic, tragic case. Yeah, the, the other thing that I, that I should point out just to make sure it's clear is that, um, Although the original prosecutor did apologize eventually, the prosecutor spent a long time trying to prevent uh, Ford from getting out, out of prison. So this is not one of those, I mean, as you know, some, a few jurisdictions now have conviction integrity units and a few prosecutors have taken the lead in trying to, to address the wrongful convictions, but this was not one of those cases. So. True. Um, so what are some of the takeaways from the book that people uh, should know about? Well, I think one is that the criminal courts are the part of society least affected by the civil rights uh, movement. Uh, we see not only race discrimination in all kinds of sentencing, as we talked about a moment ago, uh, but we see race discrimination in jury selection. We go to courtrooms all over the country uh, where you're in communities that have a fairly substantial black population and yet the jury is all white uh, because prosecutors still use their discretionary or what I call peremptory jury strikes to uh, remove people of color uh, from serving on juries. Uh, that, that has been true ever since the Civil War uh, and it's still true today and it's a remarkable thing that we haven't done more uh, to deal with that. Uh, but we still see that. And uh, basically what the courts have, have done is said, you know, that if, if there's an objection, the prosecutor has to give reasons, but then the judge is supposed to figure out did the prosecutor strike for the reason given or did the prosecutor strike race? Well, how could that ever work? I mean, the judge doesn't know. Uh, the prosecutor's probably a combination of reasons. Race was certainly one, but it may also be others. The courts accept very trivial reasons uh, to uphold the way the person looked, they didn't make eye contact, they roll their eyes. I mean, really trivial reasons. Uh, one case was decided by the United States Supreme Court. The prosecutor said, I, I struck the person because uh, he had a mustache and a beard. Uh, what does that have to do with anything? Uh, and yet the Supreme Court said that was a valid race neutral reason for striking this uh, two actually African American men uh, from jury service. Yeah, David has a mustache and a beard, so, you know. <laughs> uh, I want to add, so so certainly one one major theme is the influence of race. We don't have a chapter on race because it you'll notice it pops up almost everywhere. So um, prosecutors, overwhelmingly white, of those largely white men. Uh, Steve talked about um, material discrimination. It pops up when we talk about bail and the importance of, and the criminalization of poverty. So. Um, all other things being equal, Black people are more likely to get higher bail amounts, which means they're more likely to be stuck in jail and end up pleading guilty. Mm -hmm. Black people, all things being equal, they end up getting longer sentences as well. So it really pervades the system in, in many uh, nefarious ways. The other thing I would say, uh, another thing that we'd like people to take away is that is, well, is the following. So wrongful conviction. So innocence has gotten a lot of attention in the past 25 years. Uh, 
And rightly so. I mean, first of all, you could say the greatest failing of the of the criminal courts. There are many, many failings, but perhaps the greatest one is the failure to distinguish between the guilty and the innocent. Um, and I think that to some extent, the energy behind criminal reform of the criminal legal system has a lot of it has been motivated by by innocence. But the the wrongful convictions in a in a you know, in, in an unfortunate sense, are really just the tip of the iceberg. Because as many people have pointed out, the, the reasons why people are convicted unfairly are also the reasons why millions of other people do not get um, do not get equal justice, right? So one reason people are convicted unfairly is prosecutors are hell-bent on victory and don't play by the rules. One reason people are convicted unfairly is the lack of the, an effective right to counsel to poor people. Another is elected judges who are willing to rubber stamp prosecutors' um, requests in order to get a good record of convictions, jury dis discrimination and jury selection. Another one is mental illness. So we have a chapter on, on mental illness. If you look at the people who are, well, first of all, in the criminal legal system, secondly, sentenced to death or executed, uh, wrongfully convicted, a lot of them are either uh, have severe mental illness or intellectually disabled. So these problems. Um, I would say, you know, wrongful convictions, pick your metaphor, tip of the iceberg, canary in the coal mine. Um, to, to the people who, are, who have been brought into the discussion by those issues, I think we want them to understand that the issues run much deeper and they affect not 20,000 people, but they affect millions of people, right? We have about 2 million people locked up now in the country. We have more, about 4 million on probation and parole. So it's, uh, this is a, you know, a problem of epidemic scale. Yeah, I always refer to wrongful convictions as kind of the gateway to the injustice system because um, it was basically through uh, really the DNA testing that, that proved beyond any doubt that we are locking up innocent people. And then through that, we're able to find out, okay, why are they being uh, wrongly convicted? And then all of a sudden we've uncovered all of these problems, everything from eyewitness identification to bad forensic science to, um, you know, just ineffective defense and a whole host of other things. But, you know, because we discovered all these wrongful convictions, then all of a sudden you can't really argue anymore that these other problems don't exist. And the conventional wisdom not very long ago was that there were no innocent people being convicted. You know, right. the judge learned hand uh, said, you know, with the presumption of innocence, a reasonable doubt standard and all those things, as he said, the idea of a innocent person being convicted is an unreal dream. Well, if you said that today, you'd be left out of uh, wherever you were because uh, uh, we have these uh, innocence projects all over the country uh, finding uh, people who've been locked up for 10, 20, 30, 40 years who, who are innocent. We have these conviction integrity units that keep uh, finding people and, and letting them out. Uh, and, and so we see, as James said, that uh, the system is failing and really the most fundamental thing. I mean, you really don't you want to keep innocent people out of prison and you want guilty people to go if that's what the system is supposed to do. And if you're not doing that, if you're convicting a lot of innocent people. And of course, DNA is what told us that that was wrong, uh, that you could actually uh, prove beyond any question that the person convicted was was innocent. Uh, and very often, you could find out who the actual perpetrator of the crime was as a result of DNA testing. Uh, so we need to be much more humble about this system, uh, because it's a very human system. It's not well operated in many parts of the country. Uh, doesn't have people who really are up to the task of uh, administering justice. Uh, doesn't mean you don't have to deal with some of these issues. Of course you do, but you, there ought to be, as I say, some humility uh, with regard to uh, what kinds of things the criminal courts are doing to people. So one of the things that we do is we send uh, interns, most of them are college students, into the court to monitor for injustices. And we often are looking at um, low profile cases where 
it, it's kind of what we call everyday injustice, the name of our show, in fact. Um, because, you know, uh, you're right, you know, wrongful convictions and, you know, death penalty cases, um, you know, get all of the publicity, but on an everyday basis, there are problems. So I, I was just watching this case locally uh, this week, guys on trial for murder, and um, the defense raised the question about mental competency, and they had the psych evaluation. The doctor agreed that he wasn't competent to stand trial, but the prosecutor decided um, they're going to challenge it. Um, and so in California, uh, they're entitled to have a jury um, decide whether or not a guy is competent to stand trial. Now, that may not seem as absurd as it does, but um, the thing that, that strikes me is, so now the prosecution's presumably going to get another, you know, psychiatric evaluation that shows that he is competent, and they're going to put evidence on competing psychiatrists, maybe, that, um, you know, and, and now these 12 laymen are going to have to figure out which psychiatrist is more qualified. And, um, you know, the defense is like, hey, we'd prefer to have a court trial. And the judge is like, oh, sorry, uh, prosecution's entitled to a jury trial, so there's nothing we can do. Um, it, it just seems absurd to me. Well, there's some other states that have jury trials, including Georgia, for, for de determination of competency. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's the law, if, like if you go to law school, right, if, well, I mean, if you read the statutes, like the statutes say you can't try somebody unless they understand the proceedings against them, they can co cooperate with the lawyer and and so on. And that seems to make sense. Right? And, the law, and the law also says, you know, you can't execute someone who doesn't understand the reasons why he's being executed and so on. Um, but, you know, the, 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 the problem, as we discussed in the chapter on mental illness, is that, you know, we're just making guesses. We don't understand the brain very well. <laughs> you know, we're not putting these people under MRIs and that wouldn't help. We don't, that wouldn't help. We, MRIs aren't good enough at this point. We don't know enough to know anyway. Uh, so you're asking, you know, either 12 lay people or you're asking a judge, which is not often not that much better, right, to, to guess at what's going on in someone's head. And the prosecution most of the time says the guy's faking it, right? <laughs> so, and so, so, yeah, on the one hand, you know, we have these statutes that seem reasonable, but, but the application can just be, um, and when you look at how some of these cases come out, uh, the way they're applied can just seem completely, you know, Orwellian. I wanted to mention about court watching, and you're absolutely right that that uh, everyday injustice is a great a great name for the podcast because it happens on all levels, you know. And the uh, when Steve was executive director of the Southern Center, and we still do it, we send people, often interns, to watch courts in small circuits around Georgia. And you see, I, I mean, that's one way that the Southern Center found out about you know failures of the right to counsel in certain counties, right? By just going and watching <laughs> to be actually. And particularly, um, I think in juvenile cases, there are many, many places in this country where particularly juveniles accused of crimes don't have access to lawyers. So it's, uh, um, I mean, it's a, it's a great service. I think some law schools do it, some nonprofits do, but the more light that can be brought onto, onto these small courts, I think the better. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, we did that. We would send our students to court they count the constitutional violations <laughs> uh, and they would go and they would sit and watch and we just saw all kinds of things. A lot of what we talk about uh, in the book is fines and fees and how poor people who can't afford anything uh, come into court and they're given a fine. They can't afford to pay it. The court says, well, we'll give you a year to pay it, uh, but we'll put you on private probation and you've got to pay the probation uh, company $45 a month. So now you've got it another a surcharge onto the fine. So the person owes a thousand dollars. Now they owe another forty-five dollars uh, a month for twelve months. Uh, and and what we see, of course, is people just sinking under this debt and people uh, going to prison because they they can't they can't afford it. Uh, they're really there are a lot of debtor prisons uh, in this country, uh, and many people think they're not, but they're all. You want to follow up really quickly on 
a point you made earlier, Steve. Um, you you mentioned that you know the criminal legal system has not been impacted by the civil rights movement. Why do you think that's the case? Well, I think a lot of it's historical. A lot of it is uh, cultural. Uh, but you look at prosecutors, 95% of prosecutors are white, uh, 80% are white men. Uh, that's not representative of all of the country. Uh, but, but that's, uh, you know, who have been in these positions. Uh, you look at the judiciary. Of course, we have an elect in the state courts, which is where so many people are being sent to prison and sentenced to death row and all that. Uh, we have elected judges. Uh, we know that in Houston, for example, that uh, lawyers, not very competent lawyers, often give money to people running for judge. And then when those people get elected judge, they appoint those lawyers to represent people in death penalty cases, even though lawyers may be completely unqualified. Uh, and they handle those cases and get paid a lot of money by the judge. It's, it's a political patronage system. Uh, so it's not really uh, about, uh, you know, uh, uh, doing what's just. It's, it's about keeping a, a political patronage system going. Uh, one other thing, though, back to the race part of it, is that we see so much that judicial districts uh, all around the South, where you have a pretty substantial uh, Black population, but they're drawn in a way to dilute uh, the Black vote, so you don't end up with uh, you know, a judiciary that anywhere nearly reflects the population uh, of the state. Take Alabama, for example, is about a third African American, and yet the nine members of the Alabama Supreme Court, five members of the Court of Civil Appeals, five members of the Court of Criminal Appeals, all those judges are white, not a single African American, and all the judges. Uh, and if you look at the trial court judges, you see two uh, very, very few uh, African American trial judges. I want to add, I mean, Steve is absolutely right about the, the, the makeup of the people who run the criminal legal system. Um, on the substantive side, just to go back to McCleskey, so, you know, there are other areas of the law where disparate impact, disparate racial impact is a cognizable claim you can make, right? In McCleskey, the Supreme Court essentially said, here you can't. Uh, I think one of the words from the majority opinion is that at the end of the day, McCleskey was sentenced to death because he committed a crime for which the death penalty is an, an allowable punishment, something like that. So they made it all about him. Um, and so that case, you know, we, we talked about a fear of too much justice at the beginning. In the Supreme Court, you know, the, Justice Powell kind of realized, well, if we're going to allow this, this to proceed, we're going to have to allow disparate impact when it comes to every kind of sentencing. We're going to have to allow disparate impact by other protected classes. We don't want to go there. Um, which is, I don't know, ironic is probably not the right word, but but we allow it in housing and employment in areas where less is at stake than someone's life. Um, so we have a legal system which which kind of said, we're just not going to go there, um, at least on the substantive side. And then, the, as again, the makeup of the people who matter is, is uh, I don't know, I mean, like, if any Fortune 500 board of directors, <laughs> you know, had an all-white all -white board of directors, they would be doing something about it, you know, so. Yeah, it seems like the court just realized that if they open the box, they would have to open it all the way. And, and they're like, yeah, we'll just keep it closed. And that is, yeah, that's, I mean, that's essentially what Justice Brennan, I think, was saying. So. Um, so as a whole, are you guys hopeful for the future of reform or pessimistic? I think, Steve I think we have to be this. hopeful. We have to try to do what we can. We try, as I said earlier, we try to point out uh, Washington State Supreme Court found the death penalty was racially discriminatory, declared it unconstitutional under the state constitution. That's something to be very encouraged by. Somewhat discouraging is the fact that there are 49 other states. So that means you've got to fight these battles in a lot of different places. But I, I think what we have to realize is that much of these things are at the local level, the local courts, state Supreme Courts, uh, local legislatures, all of those things. And uh, I, I think the important thing is to make sure we know what, the, you know what our North Star is here, what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, and, and then try to accomplish in these places. Yeah. I want to add, I think that 
optimistic, pessimistic. I mean, things are improving in some ways and getting worse in some ways, right? As I'm sure you've seen. The death penalty, things are actually getting better. If you look at compare now to 20 years ago, the number of death sentences, the number of executions is way down. And the major reason for that is um, in many states, uh, people facing the death sentence get better representation than they used to. And people like Steve and the Southern Center and other organizations have shown that, you know, if you have able counsel and sufficient resources at the trial level, almost all the time you can talk a jury out of a death sentence, right? And as the death sentence is getting used less and less, it gets imposed more, less and less, and more and more states are saying, like, what's the point of having this on the books, right? Um, hopefully California will come to that realization at some point. I believe there's still 700 people on death row, but there's no prospect of an execution, right? So classic example, like, why do we have this thing anymore? Uh, other areas, certain issues, you know, have gotten, there's been progress. Bail reform is one. Certain issues that are, you know, that affect, um, say, you know, like nonviolent offenders, nonviolent poor offenders in jail. You know, there's certain issues on which there's been mobilization and there's been progress. In other ways, you know, the prison populations are stubbornly high and they're largely high because of people who did commit violent crimes and got very long sentences. And there isn't really much momentum towards helping them. So, I, you know, these things go back and forth. I think there's certainly grounds for, for optimism, but, uh, you know, it's too early to say that we're, there's a clear trend towards improvement across the board in the, in the criminal legal system. I don't think we can say that yet. I think that's a fair assessment. I I answer that question by saying, ask, uh, depends on the day. Um, <laughs> because there, there are days where I, I just shake my head and go, it's hopeless. And then there are days where, okay, I see a little light at the end of the tunnel. Um, you know, the place where... I think I see kind of the most light is that even the more conservative people in the criminal legal system are, are kind of understanding that prison isn't the answer for everything, which is a big change over 20, 30 years ago. Um, but, you know, we're still incarcerating way too many people. So, um, you know, we got a long way to go. Yeah. Um, so, just kind of uh, maybe uh, one or two final thoughts by each of you, and then we have to wrap up. Well, on your last point, the prisons are not only uh, have a lot of people, but they're enormously expensive. Uh, and one thing recently uh, that happened in Georgia on a Republican governor was some criminal justice reform measures. Of course, they're never everything that I would think or James and I would think ought, ought to be. Uh, but at the same time, by getting a lot of low-level drug uh, people out of the courts and, and into uh, community programs, the prison population uh, declined. And what is really most important, what's really impressive about it is the percentage of African-Americans in that prison system declined. Uh, so, uh, you know, again, I think what will ultimately answer the, some of these questions is just the enormous cost of trying to carry on what we're doing now. It's unfortunate that the Supreme Court, which could play such an important role, is probably not going to for the next generation. Uh, but I don't think that means that uh, we give up. I'd say the most encouraging thing to me are the students that I teach that go out and are determined to provide people with good representation. I think that, I think your court watchers who are going to court and telling people what are happening there and bringing attention to it, I think those things are, are what's going to improve things in the future. I would say, I certainly agree with everything Steve said. The last chapter of our book is called uh, More Justice, Less Crime. And it's a, it, it doesn't try to summarize the whole book, but it, the, the chapter before that is about excessive punishment, right? And the last chapter tries to talk about how a, sensitive may be a bad word, but you know, a, a system that tries to address the root problems of crime, the root problems of people who commit crimes, and tries to come up with solutions that will, you know, best help, not only best help in many cases, the victims or victims' families, so the communities that are in those kinds of solutions, um, will result in more, fewer people in prison and will also increase public safety and reduce crime. You know, one, there are many reasons for this. One reason is that um, 
you know, one thing that people have found in the past 10 years since the shooting of um, Michael Brown in Ferguson has been that when the relationship between a community and law enforcement and the and prosecutors and the criminal courts, when that relationship breaks down, when no, people no longer trust uh, the authorities, then it becomes harder to clear homicides, becomes harder to solve crimes. And in, in many places in this country, the system has been so punitive and so discriminatory and so unfair for so long. Um, unfortunately, many many of the places where there's most crime, um, we've we've gone past the point where locking people up is having is having a public safety benefit, and we're pretty clearly at the point where it's it's making things worse. So, you know, will people realize that? I, I'm not sure. As as you said, I think that there is a certain segment of even conservative. Uh, officials and lawmakers who are interested in pragmatic solutions, you know, what will reduce costs, what will uh, keep crime levels manageable. And that could be a way that will help us have progress in the future. Um, on the other hand, you know, we do have the backlash from, for example, the previous president who was essentially into punishment for its own sake. And, you know, one of his last acts was to have a spate of executions. So that that nastiness um, is still there. Um, and we'll have to start to see which which wins out. Well, I want to thank both of you for joining us and talking about this very interesting topic. The book is The Fear of Too Much Justice, the authors Stephen Bright and James Kwok. This has been Everyday Injustice. I'm your host, David Greenwald. Join us again next time for more tales from the injustice system.